show sa lahat. So today yung sixth and last meeting for our series entitled na Postmodernism and Its Children. And ngayon, we will talk about social justice. Before we start, I would just like to give a disclaimer na dito sa series, nag-heavily rely ako sa book ni Helen Lockrose and James Lindsay na entitled, Cynical Series, How Activist Scholarship Made Everything About Race, Gender, and Identity, and Why This Harms Everybody. So yung pag-explain ko ng social justice, yung mismo words na ginamit, yung ginamit ko to explain social justice. Ang gagawin natin today is una, I will give you introduction about social justice. So dito, I will give you an overview about the topics na na-discuss natin for you to identify kung ano ba yung social justice in itself. And next, we will discuss yung evolution ng postmodernism. Second, we will discuss yung standpoint epistemology and also ang intoler- intolerance ng social justice and disagreement sa kanilang views. Third, we will give our critique and also yung biblical insights that we have about the issue. So let's start sa pag-discuss ng introduction about social justice. So dito, si Pluckerus and Lindsay talked about reification. Ang meaning ng word is to make something real. And they are referring to mga concepts na abstract, tapos ito naging real. So nung 2010 daw kasi, nag-start ng scholarship na matatawag na nasa category na social justice. So ito yung tinatawag na third phase ng postmodernist project. Sa third phase na ito ay yung mga abstract and self-doubtful na postmodern na knowledge and political principle ay taken for granted na ng mga scholars and activists as real. Ito ang reason kaya sila said to be reified. So now dito, uh, si Pluckerus and Lindsay gives a rehash ng mga diniscuss nila sa previous chapters. So if you remember yung first meeting, uh, we talked about postmodernism and that ito ay merong two principles which are the knowledge principle and yung political principle. Ang knowledge principle nila is ang kanilang radical skepticism about objective truth being attainable and they are committed sa cultural constructivism which means that ang reality natin ay created ng ating cultural beliefs. They also hold sa political principle nila which is ang society natin is formed ng systems of power and hierarchies na nag-decide what could be known and how. And dito we talk about postmodernists then seeing power and knowledge as linked that power decide what is deemed to be true at kung ano yung moral. And ang power na ito ay reinforced sa pamamagitan ng discourses na legitimized or mandated ng society. And ang powerful forces na ito ang nag-order sa societies into categories and hierarchies na nag-serve sa mga interest ng favored na groups. So aside sa dalawang principle na yon, we also talked about four themes ng postmodernism which are yung blurring ng boundaries, yung power of language, cultural relativism, and yung loss ng individual and the universal. So ang postmodern view na ito ay na-discuss natin na nag-flourish from 1960s to 1980s. Pero nag-burn out ng deconstructive phase nito noong mid-1980s. Though ang first phase or ang deconstructive na phase ay nag-continue hanggang 1990. So noong late 1980s, nag-start ang applied postmodernist phase which we talked about na para siyang virus na nag-evolve. Dito naglabasan yung mga applied derivatives niya tulad ng post-colonial theory, yung queer theory, critical theory, feminism and gender studies, intersectionality, at yung hindi natin na-discuss na topic, yung disability studies at fat studies. Yung applied phase ay makita roughly around 1990 to 2010. Ito ang part kung saan ay confined pa lang siya sa specific na academic disciplines, sa academia and sa activism. Tapos nung 2010, makita natin yung third phase. So ito na raw yung reified or fully concrete na yung social justice scholarship and activism. So makita na natin siya mag-take root sa public consciousness. And ito ay seen as a factual description about sa workings ng knowledge, power, and human social relations. Ang ibig sabihin nito is taken for granted ng social justice scholarship or assumed siya as true. So ito yung reification na phase. Ang social justice uses the same principles 
pero hindi mo siya neatly na ma-fit into any category ng postmodern theory. Ito ay dahil nag-intersect na siya sa iba-ibang disciplines and it uses each of the applied postmodernist na notions according sa kanilang need. So social justice scholarship then ay equivalent sa theory of everything and sila ay nag sa isang rule which is that ang theory nila ay rule and they do not tolerate dissent. So if you dissent, you will be cancelled. So now na we are able to discuss yung overview. Uh, Mag-continue na tayo sa evolution ng postmodernism para maintindihan natin yung social justice. So dito, si Pluck, Rose, and Lindsay started by saying na yung first postmodernist noong late 1960s ay isang manifestation ng radical na skepticism and despair. Tapos yung second wave naman from the late 1980s ay isang recovery sa hopelessness and they had a drive to make the core ideas of postmodernism politically applicable. Tapos yung third wave, nung late 2000 hanggang early 2010, ay fully na-recover na niya ang certainty niya and activist zeal. And after nito, they started to explain yung context ng evolution. So yung mga first postmodernist daw, nag-react nag sila largely sa failure ng Marxism. Ito kasi ang long-standing daw na analytic framework ng academic left. And they suffered from a major disillusionment. Dahil daw ang theoretical framework of choice nila ay nag-fall apart, ay nag-adopt sila ng cynical attitude that they cannot rely on anything anymore. Naging skeptical na sila of meta-narratives and kasama rito yung Christianity, science, at kahit anong concept ng progress. Pero dahil sa loss ng Marxism, nawalan sila ng hope in restructuring society papunta sa justice. Ito yung reason bakit nag-seek na lang sila to dismantle, deconstruct, or disrupt yung mga existing frameworks during their time. Ito raw ang state ng cultural thought noong 1970s. After 20 years, humina ang deconstructive phase ng postmodernism. Yung academic left, left ay nagkaroon ulit ng hope and sila ay nag-start to look for politically applicable na forms ng postmodern theory. So they used the same two principles and the four themes and they tried to find use sa mga ito. Ito ang reason bakit ang postmodern theory ay na-develop to have applied versions. Yung postcolonial theory ay ang attempts nila to reconstruct ang varied senses ng East of itself. Ang aim nila is to rescue them from the West, mostly by destroying it. Sa queer theory naman ay DC na lahat ng categories ay socially constructed at ito ay performed. Sila ay nag-continue to blur boundaries and they also deconstruct categories at sila ay nag-affirm na lahat ay fluid and changeable. Ang aim nila is to liberate ang mga tao sa categories of sex, gender, and sexuality. Ang critical race theory naman ay mas concrete at applicable dahil ito ay nag-emerge from law. Ito ay nagdala sa mga black na feminist scholars na mag-form ng intersectional na approaches, which is an approach na nag-dominate sa feminism. Ang intersectional feminism na ito ay nag ng empowerment sa pamamagitan ng identity politics at collective action, at ito ang nag-define ng current na cultural mood. Next, yung disability studies and fat studies. Uh, gumawa rin sila ng malaking theoretical work na nag sa queer theory. Pero yung premises nila ay straightforward. So for them, yung medical science ay social construct at dapat daw tayo maging proud and militant of disabled and mga fat identities. So by the 1990s, ang applied postmodernism ay andyan na and they made postmodern theory applicable at sila ay nag-focus sa identity and identity politics. So mga series daw na ito as they developed through the late 1990s papunta sa year 2000 ay makita ito sa iba't ibang identity studies tulad ng gender studies, sexuality studies, at ethnic studies. Ang nangyari ay they increasingly combined yung aims nila to become more intersectional. By the mid-2000s, Ay if nag-study ka ng any of the topics like sex, gender, identity, race, sexuality, immigration status, indigeneity, colonial status, disability, religion, at weight, then expected ka to factor in all of the others. So ang mga scholars daw ay pwede pa rin magkaroon ng particular na focus. And marami raw mixing and merging. So ito yung result ng form ng general scholarship na naglook sa mga marginalized groups and sa multiple systems ng power and privilege. Ang isa raw na example ng omission ng list of intersectional identities is sa pag-mention ng economic class. So yung mga traditional Marxist 
daw ay criticized sa pag-focus nila single-mindedly sa economic class bilang isang key factor sa society. And sila, sila raw ay ina-underestimate yung ibang mga axes ng oppression which includes those about women and sexual minorities. Yung feminist movement noong 1970s and yung gay rights movement daw ay nagbigay ng corrective sa sole focus nito sa class. Ngayon daw ay barely mentioned ng economic class unless ito ay combined with other marginalized identities. Ito raw ang reason kung bakit hindi nakakagulat to see many working class and poor people na they feel alienated sa mga leftists today. Ang mga Marxists would say na they have adopted very bourgeois na concerns. Ang movement na ito, uh, nagproblematize sa lahat ng sources ng privilege and uh, naglead ito sa mga highly educated na upper middle, upper middle class na scholars at activists na oblivious sa kanilang status and privilege sa society. So si Lockerhouse and Lindsay, they continue na marami raw sa mga marginalized groups yung nag-unite and ang iba't ibang mga streams ng South ay nag-merge to create a large pool ng similar na competing issues. So ang mga social justice na scholars and activists ay naging mas confident din daw sa kanilang assumptions. So nung 2010, yung ambiguity and doubt sa language ng postmodernism ay halos nawala na. And ang language daw nila, though still technical, ay mas clear na and they used uh, stronger na words na end with conviction. So yung certainty daw na ito ay makita sa previous na applied postmodernist stage. Uh, when we see na yung mga scholars and activists nila ay nag-distance away from radical skepticism. And they asserted ng systemic oppression ay dapat i-accept bilang isang objective truth para ito ay malabanan. So si Kimberly Crenshaw noong 1991 sa book niya na Mapping the Margins ay nagpay ng attention sa importance ng pag-distinguish between I am black at I am a person who happens to be black. Ang ibang scholars naman tulad ni Bell Hooks ay ineko ang sentiment at ang mga queer theorists ay nagmake ng similar statements about sa mga LGBT at gender non-conforming at queer na identities. Ang identities based sa national origin at history ay nagain ng prominence sa post-colonial theory. At ang fat and disabled identities, which include mental illnesses like depression and anxiety, ay naging commonplace dahil sa influence ng fat and disability studies. Noong 2010 ay ang approach na ito at ang postmodern principles at mga themes ay ginamit to interact sa mga realities na naging articles of belief nila. At mga activists at serious ay hindi raw takot to asset yung mga ito. Lacrosse and Lindsay continued na ang social justice scholarship ay heavily invested sa identity. Ito raw kasi ang ginagamit nila to determine what is true and they use identity politics to make change the world. Itong reason kaya makita natin ang scholarship in 2010 ay labeled as feminist or queer na epistemology or pedagogy. Halos lahat daw ng social justice na scholarship ay concerned with what is said, what is believed, kung ano bang assumed, ano bang tinuturo or communicated, ano bang mga biases na important sa teaching, discourses at stereotypes. Lahat ng scholarship na ito ay nag-start sa theoretical premise ng society ay nag-work through systems of power and privilege. At ito raw ay maintained through language. At ginagamit raw ito to create knowledge mula sa perspective ng mga privileged para i-deny ang experience ng mga marginalized. Dahil dito, ang scholarship ng social justice ay nag-target sa science at sa kahit anong analytical method na nag-contradict sa kanilang claims at assumptions. Ang resulta raw nito ay ang social justice scholarship ay nag-take offense sa kahit anong na nag-privilege sa reason and the evidence as a way to know what is true. Ang ginagawa nila is they demand for epistemic justice at research justice. Ang ibig sabihin nito is that dapat isama ang lived experiences, emotions, at cultural traditions ng minority groups. At ang mga ito ay dapat i-consider as other knowledges at ito ay dapat i-prioritize over reason and evidence-based na knowledge which they see as unfairly dominant. Ang research justice naman ay often nag-involve ng pag-avoid ng pag ng mga white male na Western scholars. And dapat ay in favor tayo sa mga scholars na nanggaling sa intersectionally marginalized na status. So kasama rito yung pag-undermine nila sa contributions ng mga scholars na they deem as part ng privilege na identity group. 
which is a practice that makes it hard to track ang ideas pabalik sa mga white male na founding fathers ng postmodernism. One example nito yung pag-cite ng black feminist philosopher na si Christy Dodson kay Gayatri Spivak on epistemic violence. Pero yung, yung reliance ni Spivak kay Michel Foucault ay never mentioned. Ito ay unlikely to be lazy na scholarship or oversight. And it seems to be more of a deliberate na erasure ng early na postmodern sa early na postmodernist dahil sa research justice. So itong pangyayari na to noted to ni Ange Mary Hancock sa Intersectionality and Intellectual History. So yung sabi niya, quote, One of the friendly critiques I made about the paper regarded its engagement with intersectional theory. Specifically, its use of Michel Foucault's conceptualization of power instead of Patricia Hill Collins' articulation from Black feminist thought. My claim was twofold. If the author intended to meaningfully engage issues of diversity and feminist thought in an intersectional way, then using the work of a leading Black feminist theorist formulation of intersectional power would make sense. Second, it was not clear to me that the reliance on Foucault could meaningfully contribute to advancing intersectionality scholarship, specifically given the distinctions, end quote. So yung sabi ni Dr. Cruz and Lindsay ay dahil dito, regardless kung saan ang galing ang concepts, ang only intersectionally responsible way to do research is to cite yung work ng isang black feminist na series. So now, tapos na tayo sa evolution ng postmodernism, so we will now proceed sa standpoint epistemology. So si Pluckers and Lindsay, they introduce yung standpoint epistemology sa last part ng section na who you are is what you know. So sa section na ito, ay they talk about the social justice theories na si Alexis Shotwell. And ang argument niya is that ang pag-focus daw sa propositional knowledge as if yun lang ang only form of knowing na worth considering is a form of epistemic injustice. Ang focus daw kasi na ito ay nag-neglect sa epistemic resources na, nakaka, na nakakatulong sa mga oppressed people to make more just roads. So ang makikita daw natin sa assumption na ito is that ang experiential na knowledge ng oppressed people ay of paramount importance. Kasi magagamit yun to deal with sa associated na real world phenomena. And of paramount value ito dahil sa postmodern political principle Dahil ang knowledge na ito ay nagbibigay ng resources sa mga oppressed people to be able to craft more just worlds. May assumption din daw ang mga oppressed people all have the same experiential knowledge na ito ay defined by their identities. And ang commitment ni Shotwell sa postmodern principles ay confirmed uh, when she wrote sa Forms of Knowing and Epistemic Resources, quote, A richer account of forms of knowing and a richer attention to people's lived experiences in the world helps us identify, analyze, and re redress epistemic injustices, end quote. So ito raw yung standpoint theory. So si Pluckers and Lindsay, they talk about this in detail sa section na a different kind of color blindness. Ang standpoint theory daw ay nag-operate sa dalawang assumptions. Ang una is that ang mga tao na nag-occupy ng same social positions or identities tulad ng race, gender, sex, sexuality, ability, status, and so on. And meron silang same experiences ng dominance and oppression and will, assuming na naintindihan nila experiences nila correctly and that they interpret them in the same ways. Nag-follow dito yung assumption na ang mga experiences na ito will give them a more authoritative and fuller picture. Ang pangalawa ay depende sa position ng isang tao sa power dynamic. So depende kung ano yung position nila, yun yung mag-dictate what they can know or what they cannot know. Dahil dito, yung mga privileged people ay blinded by their privilege at ang oppressed ay nagpossess of some kind of double sight na they understand both ang dominant position at ang experience of being oppressed by that position. So, si Placros and Lindsay, they cited the feminist epistemologist na si Nancy Tuana. So, sabi niya sa feminist epistemology, the subject of knowledge, good, Standpoint theory was designed to be a method that would render transparent the values and interests, such as androcentrism, heteronormativity, and eurocentrism, that underlie allegedly neutral methods in science and epistemology, and clarify their impact. 
much attention to the subject of knowledge illuminated the various means by which oppressive practices can result in or reinforce epistemic inequalities, exclusions, and marginalizations. In this way, feminists and other liberatory epistemologists aim to transform the subject of knowledge in the sense of focusing on knowledge obscured by dominant interests and values and thereby to identify and provide tools for undermining the knowledges and practices implicated in oppression, end quote. Roughly, ang idea raw is that ang members ng dominant groups ay naka-experience ng isang world na organized by and for dominant groups, habang ang members ng mga oppressed groups ay naka-experience ng world as members ng oppressed groups in a world na organized by and for dominant groups. Dahil dito, yung members ng oppressed groups understand ang dominant perspective at ang perspective rin ng mga oppressed. While ang mga members naman ng dominant groups only understand yung dominant perspective. So yung standpoint C then could be understood by analogy like a certain form of color blindness. So dito, the more privileged you are, the less color you see. Ang isang straight white male ay triply dominant and you might only see shades of gray. A black person would be able to see shades of red. A woman naman would see shades of green and an LGBT person would see shades of blue. And if you're a black lesbian, you would see all three colors in addition sa grayscale vision na meron na ang lahat. So si Jose Medina ay nag-refer dito as kaleidoscopic consciousness and also as metal lucidity. Dahil dito, if you have more oppressed identities, you have extra dimensions of sight and this gives the oppressed a richer and more accurate view ng reality. Hence, ay dapat daw na makinig tayo and maniwala sa kanilang accounts of it. Ang standpoint siri daw ay madalas makriticize for essentialism dahil they use words such as lahat ng mga black people feel this way. And ito raw ay hindi mali dahil what they do ay tinatawag na strategic essentialism kung saan yung members ng isang oppressed group they essentialize themselves bilang isang means para ma-achieve yung political action ng kanilang group. So yung mga advocates nito, hindi dinedefend ito that way though. So yung ginagawa nila to get around this accusation is by arguing na yung theory nila does not assume na lahat ng members ng same group have the same nature, but, they, but that they experience the same problems in an unjust society. Although ay sila ang namimili which discourses they wish to contribute to. Yung members ng mga groups na ito na nag-disagree sa standpoint theory or nag-deny na sila ay oppressed ay explained away na they internalize their oppression. So in other words, isa raw itong false consciousness kung saan ay nagpander sila to gain favor or get rewards from the dominant systems. So ito yung tinatawag nila ng mga Uncle Toms dahil nag-amplify sila ng dominant na discourses. So example nito yung mga black people tulad nila Thomas Sowell and si Vody Balcom. So sila yung nakikita nyo guys dyan. Thomas Sowell yung nasa left, si Vody yung nasa right. So uh, kasi hindi sila nag-agree sa view nila of social justice. Pero yung pinapakalat kasi nila ay mga conservative values. And sila mismo, they don't see themselves as oppressed. So considered sila as traitors na mga people from their group. Si Plokoros and Lindsay continues ng standpoint siri ay nasa root ng identity politics at ito ang main thing na nag-fundamentally differentiate dito from the civil rights movements para sa influential na black feminist na si Patricia Hill Collins, ang relationship between standpoint siri and identity politics ay explicit and ito raw ay crucial na element for progress. Similarly, si Christy Dodson who is arguably the most influential na black feminist, serious on knowledge, ay nag-argue na almost impossible for dominant social groups to see outside their own system of knowledge. Ito raw ay simply considered as knowledge per se ng mainstream na society. Sa 2014 paper niya na tracking epistemic oppression, nag-set out siya ng orders of oppression. Ang first two ay two forms of epistemic injustice ni Fricker, and ang third, ang most profound na order na tinatawag niya na irreducible. Ang ibig niya sabihin dito is that ang epistemic injustice cannot be simply attributed sa isang unjust na social system. Pero ito ay nag-exist mismo sa system of knowledge itself. Dahil dito, ang pag-change nito from within ay almost impossible. 
para kay Dodson, ang system of knowledge or schemata is specifically set up para mag-work for dominant groups smoothly. They do not realize na may mga bagay na hindi nila alam. At ito ay malalaman lamang nila through the knowledge systems na they oppress. Si Dodson daw ultimately asserts ng knowledge ay hindi adequate unless it includes ang experiential knowledge ng minority groups. Ang knowledge row na ito ay assumed to be consistently different from that of the dominant groups dahil sa power dynamics between the groups. Furthermore, ang knowledge na produced ng dominant groups, which includes ang science and reason, ay merely a product ng cultural traditions. At ito ay hindi superior to knowledge na produced by other cultural traditions. Dahil dito ay explicitly makita natin na nag si Dodson from two postmodern principles. Ang argument niya, which is central sa standpoint theory, ay nag-deny na ang science and reason ay nag-belong to all humans. And that ito ay same for all humans. And that she assigns this mismo to white western men. Dodson goes further by saying na if ang isang tao from a dominant group does not agree sa kanyang knowledge-producing systems, like if they do not include yung experiential knowledge, then ito ay dahil they are unable to step outside their own culture. In other words, ang legitimate na disagreement ay hindi option. And after nito, uh, si Pluckers and Lindsay, they talk about Jose Medina. So he sets out daw yung view niya in an accessible and rigorous way sa 2013 na book na Epistemology of Resistance. So si Medina, uh, he characterizes yung members ng privileged groups as epistemically spoiled and argues that they have a hard time learning their mistakes, their biases, and the constraints and presuppositions ng kanilang position in the world and their perspective. Ang study of knowledge within social justice scholarship ay sabi ni Pluckles and Lindsay ay based sa premise ng privilege spoils people and makes them unable to appreciate other ways of knowing. Ang argument ni Medina is that ang spoiled state ay nag-generate ng epistemic vices such as yung epistemic arrogance, epistemic laziness, and active na ignorance. Ang pagiging oppressed para kay Medina ay nag-confirm ng epistemic virtues tulad ng epistemic humility, epistemic curiosity or diligence, at epistemic openness. Ang mga vices and virtues daw na ito ay associated with privilege and oppression at ito ay feature na makikita sa critical race theory and post-colonial theory, kung saan ang oppressed standpoint allows a double or multiple consciousness dahil yung mga oppressed people ay nag-operate in different systems at the same time. To add, uh, ayon kanila Pluckers and Lindsay, ang line of thought daw na nag-grant ng double sight sa mga oppressed and not to their oppressor ay often attributed sa Marxism. Pero it's more accurate to say ng postmodernism and Marxism ay nag-share ng common na philosophical ancestry sa work ng German philosopher na si George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Do si Marx ay pwede masabi na significant na channel na nagdala ng mga ideas na ito sa mga postmodernists. Ang postmodernism and Marxism ay said to exhibit significant and, significant and intentional na differences. Ang key difference nila is that sa mga Marxists, Yung oppressed, they suffer from false consciousness as a result ng hidden imposition ng power. Sa mga postmodernists naman, ay they will say na ang mga oppressors ang nagsuffer sa false consciousness dahil sa socialization nila into a system of knowledge na nagbenefit sa kanila. Yung serious na si Charles Mills would state this difference from the Marxist idea sa ideology, the Rutledge Handbook of Epistemic Injustice. Ang sabi niya, quote, the racially subordinated victims, after all, of genocide, expropriation, and slavery are often quite well able to recognize their situation. It is not, or not always, that the imprisoned lack the concepts, the hermeneutical resources to understand their situation, but that the privileged lack the concepts and find them incredible or even incomprehensible because of their incongruity with white supremacist ideology. Even if they were to hear what blacks were saying, they would not they would not be able to hear them because of the conceptual incoherence of the black framework of assumptions with their own dominant framework. Whites are imprisoned, reversing the metaphor, in a cognitive state which both protects them from dealing with the realities of social oppression and, of course, disables them epistemically. End quote. So ang difference from Ito ni Charles Mills is that ang mga oppressed are able to recognize yung sarili nila na situation 
Pero yung mga privilege daw ay hindi ito naintindihan dahil imprisoned sila ng sarili nilang cognitive state. And dahil dito ay hindi nila kaya mag-deal with realities ng oppression. In other words, epistemically disabled ang privileged people. So ang ibig sabihin nito ay in Kepler, Cruz, and Lindsay is that yung social justice scholarship ay nag ng postmodern knowledge principle or in other words, they make it real and they combine it with the postmodern political principle which is a drive na baguhin ng underlying systems of power na ina-assume nito as baked sa bawat social interaction. Ginagawa nila ito by utilizing yung four na postmodern themes with an unprecedented na level on, of conviction. So ngayon, uh, tapos na tayo sa pag-discuss ng standpoint epistemology. Ngayon, we will continue sa intolerance ng social justice with disagreement. So si Plakros and Lindsay talked about this in detail sa section na thou shall not disagree with si... And dito, they mentioned ng pinaka-worrying sa social justice scholarship ay ang increasing na difficulty of speaking about issues na relevant to social justice or about sa mismong social justice scholarship. Dapat lang daw kasi ito gawin sa approved na terminology nila and also dapat you accept ang validity ng standpoint theory and identity politics. Yung disagreement ay rarely tolerated, lalo na nasa reified phase na sila. Ang disagreement daw ay typically seen at best as a failure to have engaged ang scholarship correctly. As though ang engagement ay dapat mag-imply na tanggapin mo yung kanilang view. And at worst, ay makita ito as a profound na moral failure. Dito, magbibigay ako ng dalawang examples na sinight ni Plakros and Lindsay. Yung una, yung tracking privilege preserving epistemic pushback in feminist and critical race philosophy classes ni Alison Bailey. And yung pangalawang examples naman yung white fragility, why it is so hard to talk to white people about race ni Robin D'Angelo. So let's start sa tracking privilege preserving epistemic pushback in feminist and critical race philosophy classes ni Alison Bailey. So sa essay daw na ito, si Bailey ay nag-argue na kahit sino na mag-disagree sa social justice scholarship ay hindi sincere and that they are simply trying to preserve unjust na power structures in the service of a knowledge producing the system na nag-privilege sa mga straight white men and that it prevents social justice. She de defines it sa essay niya as, quote, Privilege preserving epistemic pushback is a variety of willful ignorance that dominant groups habitually deploy during conversations that are trying to make social injustices visible, end quote. She assumes ng criticism sa social justice scholarship ay simply attempts para ignore ang truths about social justice. To add, for her, ay ang criticism ng social justice ay immoral and harmful. So yung sabi niya, quote, I focus on these ground-holding responses because they are pervasive, tenacious, and bear a strong resemblance to critical thinking practices, and because I believe that their uninterrupted circulation does psychological or epistemic harm to members of marginalized groups, end quote. Dahil mga social justice scholars like Bailey ay nag-assume ng disagreement with their work ay nag-result ng intellectual and moral feelings ay bawal daw magkaroon ng disagreement. So yung sabi niya, quote, Treating privilege-preserving epistemic pushback as a form of critical engagement validates it and allows it to circulate more freely. This, as, I, as I'll argue later, can do epistemic violence to oppressed groups, end quote. And dahil dito ay dapat ito ay shut down and palitan ng, mga so, palitan ng social justice scholarship. In fact, para kay Bailey Rao ay critical thinking itself is a problem. Kailangan daw ito palitan ng critical pedagogy. And yung meaning niya ng critical dito ay iba. Yung sabi niya, quote, The critical thinking tradition is concerned primarily with epistemic adequacy. To be critical is to show good judgment in recognizing when arguments are faulty, assertions lack evidence, truth claims appeal to unreliable sources, or concepts are sloppily crafted and applied. Critical pedagogy regards the claims that students make in response to social justice issues not as propositions to be assessed for their truth value, but as expressions of power that function to re-inscribe and perpetuate social inequalities. Its mission is to teach students ways of identifying and mapping how power shapes our understandings of the world. This is the first step toward resisting and transforming social injustices." End quote. So dito, 
clear na yung critical pedagogy looks at propositions na used to respond to social justice issues na ito ay seen as expressions of power na nag-perpetuate ng social inequalities. So hindi niya concerned uh, to check whether yung proposition is true. Next, now na we are able to show yung side ni Alison Bailey para may support tayo sa allergy ng social justice scholarship sa disagreement, we will also proceed na sa next example which is yung white fragility. Why it is so hard to talk to white people about race ni Robin DiAngelo. So sa book naman na ito, uh, ang, ang lecture ng white studies, whiteness studies na si Robin DiAngelo ay nag-develop ng concept na tinatawag na white fragility. She laid this out sa kanyang highly cited paper na yun din yung title noong 2011. She starts with an objective truth claim sa white fragility saying, quote, white people in North America live in a social environment that protects and insulates them from race-based stress. This insulated environment of racial protection builds white expectations for racial comfort, while at the same time lowering the ability to tolerate racial stress, leading to what I refer to as white fragility. End quote. Useful daw ito na insight kasi mag-lead ito sa mga white people to reflect more deeply sa kanilang mga unconscious na prejudices. And si D'Angelo is said to insist ng society are permeated by white supremacy at ang kahit anong disagreement sa kanyang ideas ay result of a weakness na nakuha ng white people through their privilege. Ang sabi niya sa paper niya, quote, White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation, end quote. Ang kahit ano na negative feelings daw about being racially profiled at for being held responsible for a racist society ay taken bilang sign na ikaw ay fragile. This is an evidence row of complicity or inclusion ka with racism. Ang white people ay seen as complicit beneficiaries ng racism at white supremacy. Ito raw ang truth ayon sa social justice at ang disagreement ay hindi allowed. Si D'Angelo mismo ay explicit dito. Ang pag-disagree, pag-remain silent, and ang pag-go away ay evidence ng fragility or mere defensive moves. Ang only way lang para ma-avoid na maging fragile is to stay put, show no negative emotions, and dapat ay mag-agree ka sa kanilang truth, and dapat ay actively ka mag-participate sa pag-discover ng truth na yun, which is ang pag-learn kung paano i-deconstruct ang whiteness at white privilege. Ito raw ang necessary work ng isang anti-racist. So si Tuckers and Lensei, sabi nila, uh, shocking daw ito, kasi si Diagilo, who is a white woman, ay nag-argue na lahat ng white people ay racist and impossible raw for them to not be racist. Ito ay dahil sa systems of powerful na mga racist discourses kung saan sila ay Pinanganak. She insists na complicit sila by default at sila ay responsible to address ang mga systems na ito. Also, she argues din na, na hindi nagmatter if ang individual na white person ay isang good person who despises racism at kung ang white person na ito ay hindi aware ng kanyang biases. Ang sabi niya sa white fragility, quote, being good or bad is not relevant. Racism is a multi-layered system embedded in our culture. All of us are socialized into the system of racism. Racism cannot be avoided. Whites have blind spots on racism, and I have blind spots on racism. Racism is complex, and I don't have to understand every nuance of the feedback to validate that feedback. Whites are, or I am unconsciously, invested in racism. Bias is implicit and unconscious." End quote. Ang personal na approach na ito, sabi ng Pluckers and Lindsay ay laganap sa white fragility and ganun din yung collectivism and pag-reject sa individuality. Si D'Angelo ay nag-insist na mga white people should see the world the way she does. Ang sabi ni D'Angelo sa book, quote, This book is unapologetically rooted in identity politics. I am white and am addressing a common white dynamic. I am mainly writing to a white audience. When I use the terms us and we, I'm referring to the white collective, end quote. Dr. St. Lindsay adds that white people for D'Angelo are a collective 
dahil sa kanilang position sa power grid sa society. They cannot help daw but to benefit from racism and dahil dito ay they must work through it. Also, ang white people raw ay socialized into having a deeply internalized na sense of superiority kung saan na hindi sila aware or hindi nila ito kaya i-admit sa kanilang sarili. Ang pwede lang daw gawin ng white people is to become more aware sa relationship nila sa power and for them to consciously address it over and over again. Ito raw yung postmodern na political principle at work. Si D'Angelo rin daw ay reject ang mga liberal na principles ng individualism and colorblindness kung saan ay seen ang race ng tao as irrelevant sa kanyang worth. Same ang liberal principles na ito sa view ni Dr. Martin Luther King at Jr. na ang view ng tao ay the same regardless ng color ng kanilang skin. Rejected ito dahil in-enable raw nito ang mga white people to hide ang realities ng own racism nila and white supremacy. And so now, tapos na tayo sa mag-talk about intolerance ng social justice with disagreement. And ngayon mag-proceed na tayo sa biblical critique natin ng social justice. So in this critique, dahil ang social justice seems, seems to be the bigger umbrella where we will see na nag-overlap ito sa lahat ng applied na postmodernist na views, mag-focus lang tayo on giving our insights sa mga issues kung saan sila nag-overlap. So dito mag-focus tayo on standpoint epistemology and yung intolerance ng social justice on disagreement. So mag-start tayo sa standpoint epistemology. So dito, we agree ng propositional knowledge ay hindi lamang ang form of knowledge. Ang lived experience natin ay parte ng things that we know. And dahil doon, it must be included sa ating discourses in the same way na we use first-hand na eyewitness testimony sa law courts and also sa historical methods natin. It's true na may access ang oppressed people sa kanilang lived experience dahil they are the people na mismo nakaka-experience ng oppression. And dahil doon, we should put it into account in any attempts or desires to help them. Nevertheless, ang admission na ito does not necessarily mean na sound ang standpoint epistemology. Dito ay we need to talk about specific things na mentioned about it. Ito ay una, ang assumption na ang mga tao who belong to the same social positions and identities have the same experiences. Pangalawa, na depende sa position ng isang tao sa power dynamic ang magdictate what they can know or what they cannot know. Doon sa first assumption, it seems na parang very convenient for someone to claim na same ang experience ng mga tao who belong sa same social positions and identities if they correctly understand and interpret yung kanilang experiences. I think na ang sinasabi nila as the correct interpretation is through the lens ng social justice. This is a question begging fallacy kasi they assume na totoo na agad ang social justice when in fact, it is the one I need my establish as true and hindi lang merely assumed. Aside from that, they need to substantiate how the correct understanding and interpretation of experiences would lead to the same experiences. I doubt na this could be the case in reality. One example na I could think of is ang aking Christian community who have the same social position as me. Many of us ay merong sound theology that we use to understand and interpret ang ating experiences. And ganun pa man, we still do not have the same experiences. In the same way, it seems to me na kahit yung mga tao na same na social justice warriors in terms of their worldview, and even though they belong to the same social positions and identities, then they still have different experiences. And ang reason dito is that ang experience ng tao ay hindi dictated ng collective, but this is dictated by their individuality. Another contradiction is that ang postmodernism, which they, they, they relied on yung seam ng blurring of boundaries. Dahil kasi sa pag-problematize nila sa pag-deny ng objective validity ng certain categories. For example, uh, they reject essentialism. One example nito yung rejection ng biological essen essentialism sa queer theory. And for them to say ng sexuality ay isang social construct. Kanina, sa discussion natin, I mentioned the Pluck, Rose, and Lindsay says ng standpoint theory I criticized for essentialism dahil they use the words such as lahat ng mga black people feel this way. But they don't see it as a contradiction kasi strategic es na essentialism siya for them to use it as a means to achieve political action. Yet, despite ang pag-argue ng mga social justice theorists to the contrary, we can argue na contradiction pa rin siya. 
do they reject essentialism, they use it pa rin para ma-achieve yung kanilang agenda. Dapat kasi maging consistent sila sa worldview nila and not just do a bait and switch when it is convenient. Another problem ng strategic na essentialism nila is that hindi ito inclusive as they try to portray. Like sa black people to really include and let all black voices be heard. They assume kasi na lahat ng black people feel the same thing. And if this is true, then ang mga black people who do not feel the same way ay excluded from the black people group. This means that mga black voices na they only want to be heard ay mga black people who agree with their agenda. Hindi talaga sila truly for making sure na lahat ng black voices will be heard. They will cancel Thomas Sowell or Vody Balcom and accuse them of internalizing their oppression. When in fact, sila yung two among the other black voices na makakabigay ng insights na truly, na truly makakatulong sa black people as a whole. Ang true na essentialism na maghear sa lahat ng voices ng black people is ang nag-regard ng biological na similarities nila. Ito ay dahil it will include black voices na different ang worldview and also mga black voices from different social positions in order to contribute sa debates ng ideas for the benefit of their group. Ito yung essentialism na hindi merely ploy lamang to be able to uphold a certain political agenda but ito ang essentialism na nag-account sa universal na similarities ng black people and also ang diversity ng individuals na meron dito. Another problem nito is that hindi talaga siya nakatulong sa desire to make the society to make the society more just. We assume na ang people with the same social position and identity have the same experiences, then lahat ng white people could be seen as oppressors regardless ng kanilang situation in life. Just because you're white, you will become assumed to benefit from the system even though you are poor or suffering from certain injustices as an individual. It heightens racism pa, lalo in mix people na kabilang sa oppressor and oppressed na dichotomy to be cynical of each other and for them to hate each other more. This causes more racial disunity and ang paghiwalay ng isang society. If a Christian will hold to this view, it will be detrimental sa unity niya with other believers in Christ. United kasi tayo regardless of our social position and identity because of our identity in Christ. So regardless if part ba tayo ng economic or ng intellectual elite, or if part tayo ng people group na considered as underprivileged, regardless if tayo ay male or female, straight or nag-struggle with same-sex attractions, ay if we believe in Christ as our Savior, then we are united in Christ. Everything that God created is good. And dahil dito, we can say ng skin color natin does not make us automatically evil if we are white, or it does not necessarily mean na virtuous tayo if we are black. Dahil dito, if we are part ng economic elite, then it does not... It, automatically mean that we are evil and that we exploit the poor. The problem why people thus injustice sa kanilang neighbor is ultimately dahil sa sin in their hearts. Though it's possible na nakakontribute ang isang system na established sa society sa injustice, it does not help anyone if it's portrayed as something invisible na hindi tayo aware dahil we participate in it. And it's contradicting for any postmodernist to assert this as if ang something invisible na ito ay bigla na lang nila na-discern and hindi pa rin sila helpful kasi they cannot point out yung specific sa system na nag ng injustice which we can all strive to change. Second, doon naman sa depende sa position ng isang tao sa power dynamic ang mag-dictate what they can know or what they cannot know we see na si Christy Dotson ay nag-argue na almost impossible for people na part ng dominant social groups to see outside their own system of knowledge. Dahil ang problem ay hindi lang mismo sa social system, pero sa system of knowledge mismo na nag-hold ng tao or nag-hold ng tao na part ng dominant na group. I would say na may contradiction sa assumption nila na ang position ng tao sa power dynamic ang mag-dictate what a person can know or what they cannot know. The fact na si Robin D'Angelo, na isang white woman, was able to know ang mga detailed things na she wrote sa kanyang book na White Fragility shows na you can know other things aside from what social justice theorists are assuming na pwede lang malaman ng white people. It also shows na hindi almost impossible to get out of the knowledge system na they impose sa whites, but that possible talaga to get out of it. And yun ang reason why Robin D'Angelo writes her book. Kasi pwede naman talaga magets ng white people ang philosophy ng mga social justice theorists kahit they are in a power dynamic na deemed ng social justice theorists as dominant. 
Another problem is ang denial ni Dotson sa science and reason as belonging to all humans and that ito ay assigned lang to white Western men. This is obviously dangerous and patronizing sa mga countries na hindi Western kasi they assign science and reason sa white men lang from the West. In a sense, ang dating ay they underestimate ang mga tao from developing countries as if hindi sila capable to use science and reason to help their own countries. Tama ang kritik nila Pluckers and Lindsay sa post-colonial Siri na I believe ay same na nag-apply sa social justice na ito ay nag-prevent ng development sa mga developing countries. Dahil ang mga developing countries ay mag-benefit sa technological na infrastructure na makakatulong na mabawasan ng human suffering tulad ng malaria, water shortages, and poor sanitation sa remote areas. Lastly, it's clear na racist ang standpoint epistemology dahil they ascribe vice or virtue depende kung saan ang social position and identity kakabilang. When in fact, ay ang vice or virtue ay parehong meron ang mga tao who belong sa same na social position and identity. Like in the same way na may good and bad na religious people and that may good and bad na hindi religious people. Ang sabi ni Jose Medina is ang privilege ay nag-spoil sa mga tao and dahil doon ay mga deemed as oppressor ay ascribed with I ascribed with epistemic arrogance, epistemic laziness, and active na ignorance. Tapos yung oppressed ay ascribed with epistemic humility, epistemic curiosity or diligence, at epistemic openness. Obviously, nag-commit siya ng fallacy of hasty generalization dahil hindi naman lahat ng mga tao who belong to a certain group ay same. If we assume kasi na totoo yung sinasabi ni Jose Medina, then ang white woman na si Robin D'Angelo pala ay pwede natin i-characterize na may epistemic arrogance epistemic laziness, and active na ignorance. But if they will concede na, virtu na virtue si Robin D'Angelo, then tama tayo na hindi lahat ng tao who belong sa same na social position and identity would have the same character. Ang character kasi ay magkakaiba depende sa individual and hindi ito determined by one social position and identity. So next, so ngayon tapos na tayo sa critique on standpoint epistemology. Ngayon we will proceed with the critique sa intolerance ng social justice scholarship with disagreement. So let's start sa argument ni Alison Bailey. Sa essay niya, ay nag-argue siya na kahit sino ang nag-disagree sa social justice ay hindi sincere and that they are simply trying to preserve unjust power structures na nag-privilege ng straight white men. Dito ay meron akong doubts whether they have the epistemic warrant to establish ang motives ng mga tao na they attack. But ang sinabi ni Bailey ay merely an assertion na hindi substantiated. And thus, hindi ito kailangan to be taken seriously. If they say kasi nang nag-criticize sa kanila ay nag-preserve ng unjust na power structures, then they must be able to substantiate kung paano ito specifically ginagawa ng kanilang adversary. To add, when Bailey argued ng pag-allow ng critical engagement or debate ay nag-validate sa privilege-preserving na pushback na mag-circulate more freely to the, detriment, to the detriment ng oppressed groups, it's obvious na maraming problems dito sa kanyang argument. Una, she labeled she labeled na privilege preserving ang pushback, which commits the fallacy ng begging the question. She needs to substantiate first kung bakit privilege preserving ang pushback na in question. If ang pushback kasi per se are regarded as privilege preserving, then basically, she is saying na lahat ng nag-disagree sa view niya ay privilege preserving and that they disadvantage ang mga oppressed groups. Obviously, ang nangyari dito ay censorship dahil hindi malaya ang mga tao to share their ideas kahit ito pa ay against social justice scholarship. Thus, ito ay nag-undermine ng human right natin na freedom of speech which also destroys our freedom. And dahil dito ay reasonable tayo to seek na form of totalitarianism ang ginagawa ng mga social justice series sa mga nag-disagree sa kanila. Naalala ko dito yung discussion sa series natin na Christianity and Politics sa Freedom of Speech. And part ng point na doon is kailangan ng government yung free speech para maprotektahan yung ability natin to think as individuals and for us to decide issues for ourselves. Dahil dito ay it is a form of protection din sa ating individual rights. I cited yung Deuteronomy 30.19 saying, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Dito makita natin sa speech ni Moses bago siya succeeded ni Joshua na he's setting before them ang iba't ibang options. Nevertheless, I he urged God's people to choose life. Based dito ay may principle sa passage ng ability ng tao to sing and decide sa mga issues freely 
ay dapat may access sila sa arguments from all sides of the issue. This could only be made possible ng freedom of speech sa isang society. Kasi yung iba't ibang viewpoint sa issue ay freely ma-express. It seems na, again, si Bailey sa principle na ito and she tries to justify ang censorship niya sa guys ng pag ng oppressed. But this is something na she needs to substantiate if valid ba siya na pag-censor ng free speech. The fact na ang totalitarianism ay justified using more Morality brings suspicion sa kanyang pag-sensor. If true ang kanyang view, dapat hindi siya matakot to be scrutinized. Sa argument naman ni Robin D'Angelo, we see na dahil ang whites ay nakatira sa social environment na nag-protect and insulate sa kanila from race-based na stress, ay any form ng racial stress ay nag-trigger sa kanila ng defensive moves such as anger, fear, guilt, argumentation, silence, and pag-leave ng stress-inducing na situation. Based dito, it's clear na hindi welcome ang argumentation as a form of disagreement or pushback from white people dahil they will be deemed as racially fragile and thus, you will be deemed as complicit or in collusion with racism. Dahil dito, it's clear na ang only way lang for you to not be regarded as complicit sa racism is that if you agree sa truth ng kanilang view sa critical race theory. Ang ganito na pag psychoanalyze nila sa kanilang opponent, it seems to me ay isang form ng gaslighting. Part kasi ng gaslighting ang pag-stereotype. And ang pag-use nila ng pag-stereotype nila ng race ng people na they want to control is their way to manipulate them to agree with them. Obviously, ay hindi effective na way ito to win people to your cause, which is yung pag-guild trip nga sa kanila. So if you're remembering discussion natin sa critical race theory, si Pluckrose and Lindsay ay sinight ang study ni David Rock and Heidi Grant entitled, Is Your Company's Diversity Training Making You More Biased? And they used it to show na yung diversity courses na nagsabi na lahat ng members ng dominant groups ay racist ay nag-result ito ng increased hostility sa mga marginalized groups. So an- ang nangyari, it inflames more racism. I think hindi dapat tayo magpag sa mga tao that would, that would accuse us of being complicit with racism or that meron tayong internalized na racism. Let's just argue against their worldview kahit ayaw nila since it's our right na hindi pwede kunin ni naman. Any worldview na nag-attempt to take away yung right natin for freedom of speech should be suspected na hindi ito for our best interests. Lastly, aside sa pag-show na mali ang social justice based on critique na we discussed, I want to show that ultimately hindi ito biblical. Si Ali Stucky, nag-argue na God cannot be both the God of justice and social justice. Dahil ang social justice ay hindi just. Sa so isang court of justice kasi, ay nag-focus ito on one thing, and that is if the person accused by truly guilty ng crime. On the contrary, ang social justice kasi ay hindi nag-operate in this way. Kasi tinatanong ng social justice whether ang person ba na nag-commit ng crime ay poor or wealthy, or if white ba siya or black, or if member ba siya ng isang group na historically oppressed. And for this reason, a young social justice is said to have abandoned justice. To support her case, Ali cited three passages. In Exodus 23, 2-3, sabi, Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. So important ito kasi hindi siya biased for the poor sa lawsuit. May kita natin na Important sa kanya objectively kung ano yung justice. Eh, sa social justice, bias na kagad siya sa poor. Kasi yung poor yung considered as virtuous, tapos yung mayaman is considered automatically as the oppressor. Tapos sa Deuteronomy 16.20, sabi, Follow justice and justice alone, so that you may live and possess the Lord, possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. And also sa Romans 2.11, For God does not show favoritism. And based dito, uh, we have good reasons to believe na ang social justice scholarship ay hindi biblical. And it's my hope that somehow I did what the late, economy, late economist Friedrich Hayek would deem as the greatest service. As I quote him, sabi niya, I have come to feel strongly that the greatest service I can still render to my fellow men would be that I could make the speakers and writers among them thoroughly ashamed ever again to employ the term social justice. End quote. So in summary, 
uh, we talked about yung introduction of social justice and discussed yung evolution ng postmodernism. We also talked about standpoint epistemology and also yung intolerance ng social justice or disagreement sa kanilang views. Lastly, we gave a critique of social justice and showed how social justice is not biblical. Therefore, we concluded na hindi biblical ang social justice. So, ito na yung end ng discussion. We can now proceed sa question and answer.